praise God. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, I'm going to keep with my subject. Oh, I want to make an announcement too. You know, every once in a while, and sometimes I think I don't do it enough, but other times uh, it could be easily misinterpreted. I do it too much. I bring in prophetic updates. I want you to know what's going on in the world in relation to the Bible. I don't think there's ever been a time like this in history other than the time right before the first coming of Jesus where so many prophecies are coming to pass. Or it's just like the time of the last week of Jesus' life where prophecy after prophecy after prophecy is being fulfilled. Well, that's what the time is now. I mean, I can't look in the paper without uh, seeing so much prophetic stuff. For example, um, the, the announcement yesterday was that the Jewish government is going to kick the Muslims off the Temple Mount in uh, Jerusalem. That is, anyone that knows prophecy knows that this is a huge development because Jesus himself, in talking about Jerusalem in Luke chapter 21, there's a famous verse that says, Jerusalem shall be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. And the expression trodden underfoot is a ritual expression. Okay, it's, it, it means some part of it that's holy will be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Let me tell you, when the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled and God switches attention to the Jews, know that we're in the last days. So when you, when you realize that, okay, what, what part of Jerusalem is sacred? Well, the holiest site to all of Israel is the Temple Mount. And you read that just the other day, terrorists sh shielded themselves on the Temple Mount, killed two J Israeli policemen. The J Israeli government's thinking of ending the trotting underfoot of the Gentiles. That's the part of Jerusalem that Jesus is referring to. That's why he used a ritualistic statement. They're going to end that. If they end that, that's an indicator of the time of the Gentiles is almost over. I mean, look, we're told to watch for his coming. We're told to be excited that Jesus is coming. Now, I understand, too, though, that for people, especially with young kids, sometimes that stuff can be upsetting. And I, I get that. I really do. And I, I try to share sensitively, you know. I don't want people to, you know, kids to have complexes, you know. But... The thing is, is the Bible's true. You just got to deal with it. It is true. This is happening. We have to live now, not 200 years ago. Now! <laughs> These things are happening every day, and I wouldn't be a faithful minister of God if I didn't at least draw your attention to it. Now, I know this is the fad nowadays among churches. Never mention any eschatology. Don't even bring it up because you're going to kill the crowd. People are going to get upset and they're going to leave. Look, we can't go by that. We've got to go by the truth. We've got to be a minister of the truth. One day, one day I'm going to give account of my service to God. And believe me, my knees knock just thinking about that day. I don't think I'm anything. We're going to give account, Nick. Don. Everyone that stood up in the name of God. Boom. So you think that when <laughs> the time of the first coming, you think any prophet would say, well, I should be prophesying that it'd be born in Bethlehem, but I don't want to upset anyone and think that, you know, we're coming. <laughs> no, no true prophet. Only false prophets do that. Okay. Look, you got to work it out with your kids. If my kids said, well, what should I do in view of the second coming of the Lord? Well, I'd say, well, you should get up tomorrow, have breakfast, and go do your chores, and, you know, whatever. If I was planting a tree and I found out that the Lord was going to come back the next day, what would you do? Well, I'd finish planting the tree. Why? Because I spent the last 35 years anticipating it. It's not going to change anything. I'm going to preach the word. I'm going to point these, these prophecies. And I'm going to implore you to be responsible parents and don't let something negative come out of explaining prophecy, okay? Like if it was all sensational or if it was all doom and gloom or if it was all just terrifying, that'd be a different thing. But no, it's just as a matter of fact, prophecy is being fulfilled. It's happening. 
Just two days ago, the President of the United States, I read an article that said that he was surrounded by evangelical ministers. I was very happy about that because I think that he needs prayer. And they showed a picture of them all praying and laying hands on him until I found out who the ministers were. One of them was Rodney Howard Brown, who is nothing less than Simon Magus all over again. Remember Simon from Acts 8, the great power of God, who was a witch, a sorcerer? He's one of the worst, most destructive people of the Pentecostal charismatic church there is. He has ravaged and ruined the church by inducing people into trances and spiritual drunkenness and denied uh, and made fun of any last shred of the fear of God that these congregations used to have. He ridiculed it and induced people to, to absolutely make fools of themselves. Now, he called, he called himself God's bartender. He said, come on up and get drunk in the spirit. This is a man of hell. And he stood right there and laid hands on the president of the United States. Why am I telling you that? Pray for the president. He's surrounded by many worm tongues, many treacherous people. Just remember uh, Rasputin with the czar? Rodney Brown is like that. Evil. Total evil, a man of darkness. So, anyway, let's go to Matthew 5. More pleasant things. The words of Jesus. Matthew 5, because I've been talking about salvation. Now let me read this all in its entirety, this passage, very familiar passage. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when men insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, how many are familiar with this passage? One of the most familiar passages in the Bible. It's so beautiful. You see it on plaques everywhere. It's fantastic. These are the words of Jesus. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what's called the Beatitudes. Well, there's a couple of things I want to say about it. it just briefly this morning, in a very simple message. Uh, number one, I want to make out this point. that uh, uh, It's a point about the person, Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is God and he became a man, okay? But what kind of a man was Jesus? Uh, well, he had a religion. And his religion that he was grown up in and raised in, just like we're raising our kids, his parents raised him, was Judaism. Judaism. He was steeped in the scripture of the Old Testament. He had a Bible. He went by the law and the prophets and the wisdom literature. You could tell by what he said. Almost, here's the thing, almost everything that Jesus said, now none of it was original, not a thing. Jesus did not come and say anything original. Everything he said is either a direct reference to or an allusion to something in the law of God and the prophets. This is the only way to really understand what Jesus is saying. So that's my first point. Everything Jesus said is either a direct reference or an allusion to the law of the prophets. I would be hard-pressed to find anything that Jesus ever said in the Bible that was original. Okay. Jesus, as a person, was a man who put himself under Scripture. He put himself under God. He was not an innovator. He's part of God's overarching purpose. And there is direct continuity from the old to the new. 
That's why when he was tempted, you see a glimpse of this, when he's tempted in the wilderness, and Satan said, turn that uh, stone into bread. Jesus did not get angry at the devil and rebuke him. He did not perform some kind of a charismatic formula. Okay. He said back to the devil himself, it is written, and he quoted Deuteronomy. Now what is the significance of this? The significance of this is this. By saying it is written, the Son of God is saying, I am not resisting you in my own authority or name. I stand here as a man under God in opposition to you. It is written, you, uh, you shall, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You read the whole passage, and Jesus is basically having a religious discussion, a debate with the serpent on Deuteronomy. Everything he says from Deuteronomy, the word of God. It is written. Now, why is that, what bearing does that have on the Sermon on the Mount? Because what I'm going to show you is that every one of these Beatitudes is a direct allusion to the scriptures that Jesus had been steeped in. Oh, by the way, there's a practical thing. If Jesus was steeped in Scripture and he's the Son of God, shouldn't we? If Jesus' point of reference was Scripture, shouldn't ours be? Someone says, well, no, I cite science or I cite this authority or I cite that authority. or Oh, so-and-so says this. Well, everyone's got their God that they cite. Everyone's got their authority that they swear by. But upon becoming a Christian... The issue of authority for me was settled. It is written. I'm a man of the word. Make fun of it. Mock it. I'll never be ashamed of God's word. It's right. It's true. Amen? Remember that song? The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are so pure. Making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right. They're just right. Rejoicing the heart. This book of the law of God shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I'm giving you some wisdom this morning, saints. Practical wisdom for your life. Put the word of the Lord in your mouth and in your soul. Speak it, mutter it, meditate on it. You're going to get better. Just like me taking blood thinners is getting me better in other areas of my life. Spiritually, just speaking the scripture is straightening out a lot of problems you think you need counseling for when really the answer is right there in your lap. It's all good. We'll do it. We'll take the time. But good Lord, the word of God is so powerful and comprehensive that just meditating on it will make a lot of people right. Yeah, sure, everyone's crazy. There's no, been no sane person ever since the fall. Everything's been off. It's just a big spectrum, okay? But there is one fixed guidance system, the perfect GPS to take us right back, direction by direction. It's the word of the Lord. The word of God is powerful, and it will make you prosperous and a good success in whatever endeavor you do. Now, all that was free. That's not even part of my sermon, all right? I'm going to go back to my sermon. You're in trouble because I feel a lot better than I have in a long time. (laughs) 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 Second thing I want to say about these simple Beatitudes, which are so beautiful. And they're so beautiful, they get, in, they get on people's walls and then people don't actually think about them. You know, it's just, it's just like such poetry. Well, a lot, of, a lot of scripture is poetry. There was a guy that's a Middle East scholar. He lived in the Middle East for 40 years named Kenneth Bailey. He wrote a bunch of books about Jesus in his setting in the Middle East. He said, you can tell by the cadence of, like much of Luke is poetry. Jesus' sermons or parables are like poetry because they have a different meter of poetry there. He says, it, it, it's, it's all, a lot of it's poetry. You read the prophets, there's a lot of that poetry. Well, poetry's beautiful. Anyway, what I want to say about this is that there are these nine Beatitudes, and they're not random. They're in order. They're in unorder. 
that means you start somewhere and it takes you somewhere. They're not random, beautiful sayings. Oh, yeah, this is nice. Oh, that's nice. Oh, this is nice. No, this is a process that he's describing. Another thing I want to say about this, which might be a disappointment to some, he's not giving you something to do. This is not something to do. This is a state of being to recognize. What do you mean? The Beatitudes are what it looks like when God is in your life drawing you to himself. From start to finish. Where does it start? Where does it go next? 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 And where does it finish? Well, in this case, you don't finish. It's like a shampoo. Rinse and repeat. Okay, go back to the beginning. It's a process. What's the first? Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, once again, everything he says is from the Bible. He doesn't say anything original. He says it from the Bible. So what's he alluding to? See, because Jesus' knowledge of Scripture for a human being is phenomenal. Amazing. If there's anything you should be good at, it should be that. (laughs) Familiarize yourself with the Word of the Lord. My goodness, incorporate it into everything. Bless the poor in spirit. Well, the first thing I want to say is it doesn't mean financially poor. The false theologians, especially Marxist theologians, which Marxism has invaded theology, even evangelical theology, and just imputed these ideas that are just outrageous. And they say, see, the poor, there's a special place for the financially poor. In fact, a U.S. politician just got in big trouble about a year ago, I remember, and it was amusing to me. I I believe wisdom cries out in the streets. You know what he got in trouble for? He gave a speech, he said, the poor you'll always have with you. Man, you would have thought he said, you know, we should just slaughter everyone that's of a lower income or something like that. The poor you'll always have with you. How dare you? That people went into an outrage. What, what an immoral man. Well, where did he get that? Jesus. And where did Jesus get it? Moses. It goes all the way back. What do you mean, the poor you'll always... Why would that be so indignant? Because the leftists have a vision they're impo- imposing on the world of a utopia that they're going to build without repentance or God. So you can't say that we're always going to have the poor. Now, why would Jesus say you're always going to have the poor? Is Jesus being callous when he says you're always going to have the poor? What's he actually saying about it? It's complicated. I'll just go with a little bit of it. It's complicated. Why will we always have the poor? Look, if you divided every, all wealth in the world and right now, supernaturally, by a push of a button, everyone got the same amount of wealth. In about a month, it'd be very close to the way it is right now. Some people don't know how to manage money. There's some people that, uh, you know, have very expensive and destructive habits and appetites. There are some people that are avaricious. There's so, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why there's always going to be the poor. But nowhere in the Bible is poverty seen as a preferred state. See, in Luke, there's another version. It's the Sermon on the Plain, but he's given some of the same stuff. And in that one, he says, uh, blessed poor, blessed poor, yours is the kingdom. But in in the Greek, which is the original language of the Bible, there's two words for poor. One is uh, penis, and one is tokos. And penis means... You don't have much money, and you're basically living hand to mouth. Okay. But that's not the word that he used. The word he used is tokos, P-T-O-C-H-O-S, which means you've got nothing, absolutely nothing. So in, well, how could blessed are the poor, theirs is the kingdom of heaven? How could that be that someone that absolutely has nothing, theirs is the kingdom of heaven? Po- poverty of spirit makes you utterly dependent on God. Blessed are those who know that spiritually they have nothing. We don't have our own righteousness. We're not good. We aren't the people, the power people. 
nothing. Blessed is the person who sees themselves the way God sees them, because when you do, like Isaiah, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up in his train filled at the temple. That's Isaiah 6. And the angels cried out one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Isaiah saw the Lord. So what did he say? Man, my self-esteem is just going through the roof right now. It's just amazing. I must be... Oh, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. He called a curse on himself. When he said, woe is me, that's like saying, I'm on my way to hell. And I deserve it. I deserve it. (laughs) What? He came into a state called poverty of spirit. And notice that poverty of spirit is the beginning. Those who don't have it will never enter the kingdom of heaven. They can't be saved. They can't be born again without first encountering poverty of spirit. If the Holy Spirit is having mercy on you, he will show you the magnitude of your sins, of your fall, of who you really are. See, this is why a lot of modern Christians don't get it. They do not get it. They don't get, for example, how could there be a hell? How could there be a hell? Isn't that a little extreme to have a hell? You got, the Lord's going to send people to hell forever? How could there be a hell? Well, they don't get two things. They don't get how bad the fall has really affected each and every one of us. Scripture's like the heart is deceitful. Who can know it? It's above everything deceitful. Or, uh, you know, there is none righteous, no, not one. <laughs> Most people don't believe that. Why don't you believe that, though? You can only believe that through a move of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit comes into your life, it begins with poverty of spirit. Man, I'm lost. I'm lost. There's nothing I can do to undo it. Blessed are those. He says, cheer up. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. You think anyone up there in heaven is saying, man, did I ever deserve this? I'm here because of me. It's me. (laughs) No. Those are the people on their way to hell, even if they think they're going to heaven because they don't get the first start, the first part. People don't get, the second thing they don't get, so that's why they don't have poverty of spirit. Let me just put it this way. And I'm talking spiritually. I'm not talking about mystical visions. They've never seen God. They've never really seen God. Because if you see God, like Isaiah, when he saw God, he consigned himself to hell. Okay? They never really see God. Now, look, I'm not talking a mystical vision. But there is God, God through Scripture, through other Christians, through, through the, what Jesus did on the cross. That's a revelation of who God is. You see this man hanging on the cross? And you think this is the best person to ever live? Why does he have to hang on the cross? Is that really what it took? To, like we sang, to save a wretch like me? Did my Savior really die? We sang it. <laughs> Alas, and did my... Was it for crimes that I did? <laughs> Really? Am I that bad? And the gospel says, yes, you better believe you are. You're so bad. You're so sinful. And so am I. Blessed are those that are poor of spirit. But there's always false prophets out there like the late Robert Schuller, who once said, don't call yourself a sinner. Jesus never called you a sinner. The fact that he died for you should show you how much worth you are, how worthy you are. You should have unconditional love for yourself. You know what that is? The hiss of a serpent. Whoever listens to that is banned from the kingdom. You can't enter in. Like I say, the stuff we're talking about here in these Beatitudes, that's not something you can do. That's a condition, a state of heart, something the Holy Spirit does in your life. That's why it's so important to go. If you don't go here, go somewhere to a Holy Spirit-filled word-preaching church because these are the means 
of grace. You see what I'm saying? Well, he doesn't leave us there. You, blessed are those who mourn. Oh, oh, but where, does, where is he quoting from the Old Testament? Well, let me quote a few verses, and you can look, look them up later if you want. But Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. And uh, uh, Proverbs says, there is the him that makes himself rich, and he really doesn't have anything. There is him that makes himself poor, but he has great riches. See, I used to be rich. I used to think I was a good Catholic kid. I was good on mass and confession. So I'm fine. I'm covered. Then one day, man, I read the Sermon on the Mount. It happened to be. And basically, you know when it says he sat down to teach? That's the posture a rabbi would take when he's going to give you the true meaning of something. And he goes through the law and shows the true meaning of the law. And according to his teaching, which I had to accept with a broken heart, that I had broken all of the law and was liable for hell. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I didn't know I was blessed. I thought I was going insane. It was the, the summer after my graduation. If someone would have got me into a clinic or something, they'd probably have me still on drugs because I was doing everything. I went to smoke pot, and then I went to join a cult called The Way, almost joined the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm like, I'm lost. I'm on my way to hell. <laughs> blessed are the poor in spirit, the Lord says, though. You think it's miserable? No, really, you're blessed. You're seeing something most people never see. Blessed are those, he said, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. No, this is not about funerals and people dying. No, this is something deeper even than that, although that's about as deep as most humans can get. You know, you cry for some of the dying. No, he's talking about a mourning. Remember, he's citing Scripture and the scripture said that in Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord has come upon me to comfort all those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And from Jeremiah, I'll turn your mourning into joy. I'll comfort them. And as we read earlier in Psalm 34, uh, the Lord is near to those that are of a broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. So what is this mourning? Old Testament mourning is mourning for the sin and condition of Israel, but also specifically for your own sin. You should mourn for your sin. To this day, it's a state that's never left me. To this day, I can think of something I, I did in, in senior in high school and cringe, God forgive me. Some can think, are you a neurotic or something? No, you just give me a new sensitivity. I hate my sins. I'm sorry for them. The Lord is near to those who are of a broken and contrite heart. Do you know what contrite means? It's an old-fashioned word. Contrite or contrition means sorrow for sins. I'm truly sorry for my sins. I'm truly sorry for the waste they brought into my life. I'm truly sorry the corruption they brought into other people's lives. I'm sorry for anybody's sin. Jeremiah saw a vision of the judgment of Israel that was coming. And before the angels were going to go out and execute judgment, and it was going to be brutal, Jeremiah, or, or Ezekiel 9. He says, send the angels out with, send the accounting angels out, basically. So angels go out with markers. And he says, just put a mark on everyone who cries and sighs over the abominations of Israel. Spare them in the judgment. What spared them? Righteousness? No. Sorrow, which is sympathy with God. They just couldn't stand it. You know, the modern thing is you're supposed to accept it. You're supposed to accept homosexuality. It's the new thing you accept. What next, I wonder? Transgenderism? All right. Well, you're supposed to accept everything. Where well, true Christians mourn. <laughs> They're sorry. They're really sorry. 
And they cry and sigh within, not accepting any of it, but waiting for a better day to dawn, the dawning of the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn. First about your own sins. See, this is a lot of people's problem, you know. They don't get it. Power and impact of sin. The corruption it brings to other people. <laughs> Sin's powerful. If you think of the only remedy is the blood of Jesus, what? The life of the best person that ever lived as a sacrifice, what? But there's a lot of people who made peace with sin. It's just something you got to go along with. He says, blessed are you if you mourn. If you mourn. The Bible says in Isaiah, Jesus' Bible, to this one will I look. Look. To this is the person I'll look for. The man that's a meek, contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. They tremble. Blessed are the meek, is what it is. They'll inherit the earth. Well, that comes right out of Psalm 37. The meek shall inherit the earth, delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Psalm 37 really is a good description of our times, and I hope you read it on your own. The bold, the real brashness of evil, the heavy-duty sinners are coming out. They're in everybody's face, and they're bullying, and they're getting their way, and they're pushing everything around, and also they just multiply everywhere. One day you wake up, and you've never seen a burqa before. The next thing you see them everywhere, all right? He says, look, don't worry. Psalm 37 will comfort you. Don't worry. The wicked spread, sure they will. But then they'll be cut down just as quick. He says, don't envy oppressors. You know how everyone wants to look tough these days? I remember a day when most decent people didn't even have tattoos. Now everyone has to have a barbed wire and have to be tough and have a mean look on their face and get right in their face. This is the envy of oppressors. This is the envy of the wicked. This is not of God. It's not of God. It's the envy. It's trying to be like the wicked. Oh, we're tough too, man. We're tough too. I even saw a tattoo that I, I consider blasphemous because it's Jesus. He's muscle bound like he just came out of Gold's Gym or something. And he's got a cross on his back. And I think, this is idolatry. This is not, what in the world? No. But this is what happens when evil goes unchecked. Nobody wants to be left out. They all want to be tough guys. But he said, hey, in just a little bit, he said, I've seen a great green bay tree spreading one day, and then the next day it was gone. People asked about it. Where is it? Gone. Okay. 92nd Psalm, if you don't mind, am I diverging? 92nd Psalm is a psalm for the Sabbath, and it's also a wisdom song because he says, um, that um, the brutish don't understand. Brutish. And of course, animalistic. They don't get it. What don't they get? Do the wicked are like grass. You know how fast grass spreads and grows? Well, you guys know because you have to mow your yard. <laughs> everywhere. Why did I just cut it? It's everywhere. Yeah, but just as quickly, it gets cut down and burned. That's what the brutish don't understand. But when the wicked and evil spread, don't worry about it. Just as quickly, it'll be cut down. But then it goes on to say, but the righteous, they're not like grass at all. Psalm 92. The righteous are like palm trees. You know, it takes a long time to get a palm tree going. A long time before the fruit comes. But once the fruit starts coming, man, a palm tree can be 300 years old and still be fruitful. Difference. Look, the meek, who are they? Meek is not weak. Moses was meek. The Bible says he's the meekest man on earth, but he confronted his brother when he sinned. He wasn't weak. What does it mean to be meek? Well, the meek... uh, the meek don't defend themselves anymore. They give up on defending themselves. They're not 
self uh, protective. Okay, someone says, Moses, I don't think you're of God. I think I'm of God. Moses didn't fight him. He said, let's just both go to God. God will sort it out. He's meek. Meeker than anybody. Look, Jesus is meek. In fact, that's one of the few descriptions Jesus made of himself. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek. Is Jesus weak? No. But Jesus doesn't need to defend himself. Just as he's brought up on trial, he didn't say a word. Why? He committed himself to God, the righteous judge, the one that's able to sort everything out. Now, let me move along here. You go from meekness to those, oh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. See, this is a process. Now, many people don't, aren't, aren't anywhere on this. There's nothing of this in them. This is the words of Jesus about what it looks like to have God working in your life. You start with poverty of spirit. God shows you something that just takes the wind out of your sails, just destroys your self-image. No more believing that I'm some great guy, or at least I'm better than them. No, that's dead. It died. I've seen the Lord, and I know I'm worthy of hell. <laughs> and that's what led me to the cross of Jesus Christ, right? But you don't stay there. You move on into uh, uh, the, the morning. It hit me. After my salvation, it hit me. Jesus died, and he had to die for my sin. I just connected it with the things I did, the people I corrupted, the words I spoke, the, the, the pride, the arrogance, the lust. <laughs> That's what it took to commend me to God. It ought to make you mourn <laughs> at some point. And then he goes on, that uh, it, it makes you meek. When this process is working in your life, you quit defending yourself. Because you know that there, you're nothing anyway, and God can well, is well able to speak and, and sort things out. You just give up on self, on defensiveness. And then you come into this area where you want righteousness. You know what that means? I don't want to sin anymore. I want to live right. I don't want a mind full of adultery. I don't want eyes that can't cease from sinning. I don't like a tongue that will stab someone in the back. I don't want to envy anybody else. I'd love it if I could just be happy for what they have. I want righteousness. Listen to what Jesus said. Man, if you get that stage, you should be rejoiced and be glad. Why? You're going to be satisfied. He's going to change us. How many glad he's going to change us? And that comes from the scripture. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. Proverbs 10.3. The desire of the righteous shall be granted. Proverbs 10.24. In the way of righteousness is life. Oh, you know, isn't it awesome to think of Jesus just steeping himself in these scriptures? It's just it's so full of them. They come out in different combinations. Teachableness, meekness. Good and upright is the Lord, says Psalm 25. Therefore, he will teach the meek in his way. Meekness is teachableness. Some people, they don't have a shred of teachableness. They know everything. Well, that means you're not in this. Well, me, I can't stop learning. Because the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Amen? But do you crave righteousness? Do you want to be good? Sometimes it's as simple as that. I want to be good. Have you ever read about Jesus and thought, I just want to be like that? I want to deal with situations that way, not my way. You ever get tired of yourself? See, I'm giving you the gospel today. This is good news. You will be satisfied if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's like, God, 
I got to quit smoking. I got to quit um, doing pornography and all this stuff. Hey, that's a good motion. Then you, you crave something better. You, get, you know that there's, I always was haunted by this idea, even before I was saved, that there's got to be something higher and purer than everything this world has to offer. Right. And I feel like that craving came from God. Let me move on a little further here. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, that too. He says, Have mercy, O Lord, on me, for I am weak. Psalm 2. He that despises his neighbor's sins, but he that has mercy on the poor, happy is he. The Lord desires mercy, Micah. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's Hosea, excuse me, Hosea 6.6. 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What does God want? I want mercy. What's he talking about? Let me simplify it. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. You see, once again, it's a process. The Holy Spirit comes in and makes you poor of spirit. And that should crush you and make you mourn. And you have a new sensitivity to stuff you never even thought about before. Someone could think you're nuts. No, that's the work of the Spirit, cleaning you up. Why? What's it take to change? <laughs> change is hard, man. Change is a process. I was justified in the twinkling of an eye. I'm going to be glorified in the twinkling of an eye. The big part, right in the middle here. Sanctified. Takes a long time. He says, uh, you go in and you begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want to be made right. Well, that's tied in with forgiving other people. See, yeah, how many here have, have been hurt by someone else before? All right, the rest of you are liars. All right, <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, you will be hurt. Jesus said it's impossible, but that offenses should come. People hurt each other. Even good people hurt each other. Imperfect people hurt each other. Husbands and wives hurt each other. Who are you going to be closer to? Nobody. Who are you going to expose more of yourself to? Nobody. Well, that takes a greater risk because that can hurt. Right? He says, blessed are the merciful. What does it mean to be merciful in this sense? It means to be willing to forgive. Why? Well, I've already seen my spiritual poverty. I've been mourning over my sins, and I'm so glad that Jesus Christ died to forgive me of my sins. And besides that, I'm sick of my old ways. Well, one of those being unforgiveness, bitterness. Sick of it. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I don't want to have a hard heart anymore. I want to have a tender heart. Well, this is, this is awesome. Like I say, none of this is something you could do. This is only something that's a state of being. This is what happens when the Holy Spirit is working in your life. All you can do is go along with it and recognize it. And you, but you get to this point sooner or later where you've got to deal with mercy. Blessed are the merciful. You have to forgive. You don't have any choice. Anyone that hurts you on any level, there is no choice for you. If you're going to continue on into the kingdom, you've got to forgive because you've been freely forgiven. You have no choice. There is no excuse for unforgiveness. After all, according to one of Jesus' parables, Anything anyone did against you, which I wouldn't belittle, people can really hurt each other and say really bad things. But in one of Jesus' parables, he made the point, anything anyone's ever done to you, as bad as it is and as expensive as it is, let's put a numerical value on it. Let's say someone sinned against me and it was a $10,000 sin. Okay. Wow. It's costly. I'm not going to minimize it. But then when you look at the debt, and if you numerically financialize that, that you owe to God for disrupting his universe, for rebelling against him, the mountain of sin that is on your record. There's a beautiful scripture. If you marked iniquity, Lord, who could stand? <laughs> But with you is forgiveness. The, pr 
process moves on. Listen to the pure in heart. They'll see God. You know what this has to do with? Not perfection. Not a person that doesn't have anything wrong with them. What is a pure heart? A pure heart means that you're not divided within yourself by several loyalties. You don't love God and fame and money and sex and sports. That's an impure heart. You got four loves. You got four or five loves. Okay, everyone loves a lot of things. That's what it means to be a human. Someone says, I love sports. I love God. I love pizza. I love uh, good company. I love skating. I love, you can fill in the blank. I love it all. Okay, but everyone is mastered at their core by one master love. You're going to love that. You're not going to love anything else anywhere near that. And if that's anything less than God, see, then you don't have a pure heart. As one guy, an author wrote a book, to be pure of heart is to only really want one thing. Not my will, but yours be done. I want to be right with God. Sure, I want everything else, but they're subservient to that love. Blessed are the pure of heart. Only they can see God. There's people that are cynical. They have too many loves. They got too much division within. They can't see God working. We just saw a miracle, didn't we, down in Mexico? Did we not see a miracle, JC? Wasn't that beautiful? Oh, man, what a beautiful girl. Anyway, we saw a miracle. We could see it. A lot of people wouldn't, not, wouldn't see it. They, they, they'd walk by and not see it all. Well, you can't see God unless you've got a pure heart. Someone says, you know what? That's just what happened here. You know what that person just said to me? That rings a bell. That was God talking to me. But not everyone can hear that and see that. If you're cynical, you can't see that. Only the pure of heart. Only those who really want God will see God. Let me move on. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called sons of God. Now, the first time I read that, I thought, well, Gandhi and Mandela. <laughs> Beware of these peacemakers. <laughs> Mandela was a terrorist. The world loves him. What a peacemaker. What a lovely guy. You think he went to prison for selling Girl Scout cookies? He blew up buildings with people in them. But they love him. This isn't the peacemaker that Jesus is talking about. In fact, if the gospel is that we can have peace with God in spite of our, friend, our sins, that God has made a way for us to be reconciled. Isn't that beautiful? Then what would a peacemaker be? A peacemaker is someone who comes to this point where he says, you know what, I want other people involved. I wish they knew the peace I know. I'd like so-and-so to be. The peacemaker, the first thought on their mind when they meet someone is, I wonder if they're saved. Because, man, I'd love it if they knew this joy. You ever stand in this church and praise and worship God, and you can feel his presence, and you think, man, I wish so-and-so could know this. I wish so-and-so could know this. Man, I wish so-and-so could be part of this. Or you ever look with someone in sorrow on their life and their miseries of their life, and you think, man, if only you knew. If only you knew what we know. Blessed are the peacemakers, See, this is the process. You start seeing that you're nothing. You're bankrupt, man. You can't undo what you did. Poverty of spirit. You mourn. You finally get it, man. You get it. Every word, every deed, everything you did to contribute to the chaos of this world. The weight of it hits you. You start to mourn. And also we mourn, sees. We mourn over the state of the world right now. People say, come on, just get real, accept it. <laughs> I don't hate gays, but I mourn the acceptance of homosexuality. It, actually, because it traps people into it. A long time ago, there was, there was an epidemic of homosexuality, but most people only spent a very short time in it. Now they're trapped. 
Why? Well, before there was a lot of societal dis disapproval, so some of them grew up, moved out of it. But when society shifts and reinforces it, it's like a prison keeping people in it. Therefore, we mourn. Right? And we are hungry and thirsty for the will of God to be done in our life. I'm tired of my sins. Now, let me tell you something. If you don't have this, then you're not even in the kingdom. You're, you're not anywhere near it. You can pray for God to bring it. Blessed are the merciful. This is where some people stop. You can stop anytime you want. I'm not going to forgive. It's a shame. It's a shame. Why? Because only the merciful have mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers. Remember the first time I ever went out to witness the people of Christ. My knees were knocking. My voice was shaking. I ran into people in Ames, Iowa that I'd sinned with weeks earlier. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm a Christian now. <laughs> but I so wanted to see him saved. You got that. He says... Blessed are those who've been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of God, heaven. You know you're on your way. You get to this point where you and the world collide. You in your true nature as a kingdom person. And some people are shocked at the level of antipathy, antipathy from the world. You could take someone, you think this is a perfectly good guy. This is a humanitarian. This is a wonderful person. He pays all his bills, blah, 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 blah. Never harm a flea. He's a do-gooder. He does everything good. But when they confront the real gospel, you see a side you never saw before. That's inevitable. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And when you first suffer persecution, you might think, I'm being rejected. I felt like a loser. My family was down on me. My friends were down on me. People I thought, well, don't believe. They wouldn't believe. And people said, get out of here, you freak. And I thought, well, what have I done wrong? But Jesus come along and says, no, rejoice. You're on the right path. <laughs> Blessed are you when they reject you for righteousness sake. Blessed are you you're the only person in the family that will stand up for truth. You're the only one that doesn't buy the Kool-Aid and drink the worldly pablum. You're the only one that can't get excited about the humanism and the do-goodism. And they all hate you for it. Jesus is saying, rejoice, that's the next step. See, it's a continuum. Poverty of spirit, mourning over your condition and the world hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sorting out the one great love that you will pursue. Figure it out. You don't be for God? You don't follow God? Or man? Right? Rise up and forgive. The person you struggled forgiving. The person you thought that the hurt was so fatal you could never forgive. Well, you're looking in the wrong direction. You should look to the cross of Jesus and realize the magnitude of your own sin. Anybody here? You can't stay there. You've got to move on. What next? Well, you've got to love people. People are perishing. People are dying in their sins. People are being deceived right and left. Right and left. Just when they could be saved, along comes a Rodney Howard Brown and sweeps them down the sewer to hell. And they, he prospers. Thousands show up to support him as he denies everything we believe. He gets to pray for the president. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished in this fallen world. Amen. <laughs> and then you go, I got to reach out. I got to share my faith. I wish others would know this joy. Blessed are the peacemakers. I want to dedicate myself to reconciliation. People to be reconciled to God. 
a beautiful, beautiful passage. I'm not going to hurry. I always say, I've got, I got to hurry. I'm taking too much time. Everyone says, don't say that. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to say that now. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Now we're ambassadors for Christ, as though we're saying, we beseech you, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. But I'm warning you, what comes after that step? Open opposition from the world to confess Christ in closing in this naked world. And a lot of people have delusions, like Moses thought when he found out he was supposed to rescue the Hebrews. He thought, well, then the Hebrews will all be into this. So he sees two Hebrews fighting. He says, why don't you, brethren, quit fighting? Who made you a ruler over us? <laughs> You come to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? The opposition is so fierce that Moses ran away for 40 years. The hatred is visceral for everything good. You step your head above the trench and go out there in the name of Jesus in boldness and share the faith. You will be persecuted. Of course you will. There's a big spectrum of persecution from Simple rejection to what you saw with the Egyptian Christians getting their head cut off. But Jesus says, look, you're still on the path of blessedness. This is really what happiness is. This is what it means to be in the kingdom of God. Father, in the name of Jesus. That's how they treated the real prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And we know the way they treated the false prophets. They loved them. They feeded them. They applauded them. They couldn't get enough of them. Father, if there's anyone here that this process has not yet begun, I pray that you would, through the power of the Holy Spirit, bring each one of us into this state of being. That you'd Work that holy poverty of spirit and that holy mourning, this process which you ordain to change our deep-seated, deep-set sinful ways. We open our heart to you. We ask you to give us a greater measure of the spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.